Hello, everyone. Welcome to our international grand rounds today. Um, this is our uh, this is help for the world, and today um, I'll be introducing Dr. Bilal Hamid. He is an associate professor of medicine at the UCSF, and today he'll be covering the topic of acute liver failure. Um, during the talk, we'll have participants include questions in the Q and A box. Throughout the uh, lecture, we can uh, at the very end, go over the Q and A's at the end and have Dr. Hamid go over with us. So without further ado, this is Dr. Hamid and on the topic of acute liver failure. Okay, uh, thank you everyone. Uh, as uh, uh, Molly has mentioned, uh, my name is Dr. Hamid. I am one of the liver transplant specialists at UCSF Medical Center. And one of my area of interest uh, is acute liver failure. Uh, and I hope that uh, in the next 40 to 45 minutes, I will try to uh, give a basics about what acute liver failure is, uh, what are the common etiologies of acute liver failure, as well as how do we manage acute liver failure, uh, especially focusing on some of the updates, uh, what we do uh, in the U.S. Uh, the learning objective of my talk, again, is uh, define what acute liver failure, and a lot of time I'll just use the word ALF, which means acute liver failure, and list the etiologies. Uh, what are uh, the uh, indicators that how we define how these patients will going to do if they develop acute liver failure, and which patients will need liver transplantation, depending on is the availability, but in the U.S., we do consider that as one of the treatment and curative option. Uh, we will talk about some specific therapies and elements of basic supportive care for acute liver failure, and in the, uh, in the end, some outcomes for these patients. Now, what is acute liver failure? So as the word mentioned that these are the patients who have no underlying liver disease, meaning that these are the patients who does not have history of liver disease or cirrhosis of the liver. They were perfectly healthy individuals who develop three things. One is coagulopathy, which is development of, um, uh, you know, in the INR, which is the protein which is an important function of the liver if it's greater than 1.5. So coagulopathy is one of the uh, important aspects. The second is development of hepatic encephalopathy, meaning that when you have increased toxins build up because of the liver failure, especially ammonia, these patients can have different scenarios. And we'll talk about the grading of hepatic encephalopathy in a patient with no pre-existing liver disease. Again, acute liver failure is based on in patients who have coagulopathy, which is INR greater than 1.5 in the presence of hepatic encephalopathy in someone with no pre-existing liver disease. So it is very important to understand that concept because there are patients who had underlying liver disease or cirrhosis came in with hepatic encephalopathy or decompensation, and those are acute on chronic liver failure, so we need to differentiate what acute liver failure is. Secondly, there are patients uh, that who has uh, elevated bilirubin and elevated liver enzyme with ALT, AST in 1000 with coagulopathy, but has not developed hepatic encephalopathy. And for those, we use the word acute liver injury, not acute liver failure, in order to have a failure you need to have three, uh, these three components, especially hepatic encephalopathy. Now, most of these patients has a biochemical evidence of moderate to severe acute hepatitis, meaning that their ALT and AST is greater than five times upper limit of normal. And as you know, most of the time we see these ALT and AST is greater than 1,000 in majority of these patients. Again, we already talked about evidence of coagulopathy, which is INR greater than 1.5 in encephalopathy in patient with no pre-existing cirrhosis. Uh, and most of the time, although we do define acute liver failure, whether it's hyperacute, less than four week acute or subacute, but the duration of illness is ideally less than 26 weeks. That, you know, these patients, depending on the etiology, within 26 weeks started having like, you know, 
elevated liver enzyme, coagulopathy and encephalopathy, some of the causes like acetaminophen, which is one of the most common in the US, developed pretty quickly within a week, but some other drug-induced liver injury or hepatitis B can take more than a few weeks. There are a few exceptions to the rule of pre-existing liver disease that there are patients uh, in the US, we see Wilson's disease or someone with hepatitis B history, meaning that they had hepatitis B, but they have now does not have active hepatitis B, they have core antibody, or they didn't know that they have hepatitis B and then given chemotherapy and immunosuppression. And although they were prior hepatitis B, but they flare up, but the liver was otherwise fine. And so they can be uh, included in the definition. But again, most of these patients have no prior history of liver disease with no pre-existing cirrhosis. Now, this is considered an orphan disease, meaning that this is a rare event. Even in the US, we see about 2,000 cases per year. But this is one of the most severe form of liver injury. So it's very important to identify these individuals because if you don't manage them well, they can get really sick and they can die from the liver disease. In the earlier era, where, when we didn't have liver transplant, we didn't have better ICU and critical care, uh, these patients will not were, had a very poor survival of less than 10%. Uh, for us, when we were studying this disease clinically, it's very uh, fascinating, but also very uh, frustrating because it's hard to treat and even more difficult to study because most of the studies uh, that we have done in our network uh, for NIH-funded studies was very hard to enroll because we didn't have that many patients. So I will show, uh, share some of the data uh, with these patients on the, uh, from our, our network. So there are many causes that can cause acute liver failure. And this is just an idea, it may not be a complete list, but these are some of the common things that we see in the US. And as I mentioned, I'll show you some data from the US that the most common cause in the US is acetaminophen. Then you have acute viral hepatitis, uh, especially A, hepatitis B and hepatitis E, depending on which part of the world you are in. Uh, there are other causes like, you know, in pregnancy, the health syndrome or acute fatty liver of pregnancy. Uh, in someone who had, um, you know, history of oral contraceptive or someone history of, you know, myeloproliferative disorder, we sometimes occasionally see Budd-Chiari syndrome, which is the occlusion of hepatic vein can present with acute liver failure. Uh, one of the common, other common causes in the U.S. is drug-induced liver injury. And depending on uh, you know, which part of the world you are, different, different medications that have been associated with this. Uh, there are supplements that uh, people use that can cause, very rarely we can see mushrooms as one of the causes in the US, autoimmune liver disease or autoimmune hepatitis, ischemia or shock liver, someone who was really sick with heart disease or other thing can present with uh, acute liver failure. Uh, we have seen herpes, other viruses, even EBV, CMV, adenovirus can present. And about like, you know, one third of the cases in a lot of part of the world can be indeterminate, meaning that there was no exact etiology that was determined. Now, the important thing is once you develop acute liver failure, it does not matter what the cause of acute liver failure is. There are a lot of complications or affect from this cause that we can see. We already talked about two of the important thing is the development of hepatic encephalopathy or coma and coagulopathy. But these patients will be the sickest patient when they get sick uh, and in the ICU, they can have shock, they have risk of bleeding, risk of infection and renal failure. So again, it is important to identify and we'll go over some of the uh, uh, you know, workup that we recommend if these patients do present without any clear etiology and what testing to do in these patients. Now, when we look at the worldwide causes of acute liver failure, and if you wanted to read one paper on this uh, cause is there's a paper in New England Medical Journal in 2013, but uh, from the King's College, uh, Dr. Uh, Will Burnell, and they looked at the worldwide causes of acute liver failure. And then, um, you know, they looked at Germ uh, US, United Kingdom, Germany, Japan, Bangladesh, India, and Sudan. 
Uh, again, it's not a complete list, but the bottom line is that if we uh, look at the causes, mostly in Asia and Africa versus the Western world, is in the Western world, this acetaminophen <clears throat> is still the number one cause. So just give you an idea, in this paper at least, and things can change, but in United Kingdom, at that time, about 57% of the cases was acetaminophen, hepatitis B was 5%, the other drugs or drug induced injury was 11%. Depending on which year you look at the data, acetaminophen in the US can be anywhere between 40 to 50%. Hepatitis B is only 7%, and other drug induced liver injury was 13%. Again, uh, you look at the unknown causes or undeterminants 18%, 17%. And same with the Germany. However, if you look at the other part of the world in Japan, 42% was hepatitis B. In Bangladesh and India, it's a huge number of patients with hepatitis E. In Bangladesh, about 75%. In India, it was 44%. Uh, there are many patients in India which were unknown. Uh, the data from Africa was mostly from Sudan in this paper was hepatitis B was 22%. Hepatitis E was 5% and the other. And then, uh, you know, there's no cases of acetaminophen in Sudan, no cases in India, no cases in Bangladesh, no cases in Japan. And same with like unknown causes can be increased and maybe there were some other viruses or other thing which was not diagnosed. So depending on which part of the world you are in, it's important to understand what are the common ideology, but most of the time that what we have seen in the Western world, acetaminophen is one of the most common cause of acute liver failure, then drug induced liver injury, and then some unknown causes. And the rest of the is the viral hepatitis, mostly hepatitis B, hepatitis E, hepatitis A. And then there are some other causes that we uh, that uh, you know have to do some work up based on uh, some of the testing you need to do. Uh, this is the registry in the U.S. Uh, for the past 20 years, we were collecting the data on different uh, adult uh, liver transplant centers, and we have this registry called Acute Liver Failure Network, and then uh, this is the data from 2017, and there were about close to 2,500 patients from 1998 to 2017. And most of the common cause in our registry and our studies were acetaminophen, which we also call APAP or acetaminophen, which was 46%. Then drug-induced liver injury was uh, 11%. So in the U.S., uh, we, hepatitis B, hepatitis A, and other causes were rare. And indeterminate causes was 12%. However, when we went back and looked at these indeterminate causes, a lot of these cases were actually acetaminophen. So this number is more close to 50 to 55% of acetaminophen cases. Uh, again, we do see uh, other causes, but when we see a patient in the US without etiology, we consider acetaminophen as one of the most common uh, or one most likely etiology in the US as a cause of acute liver failure. And the reason I am talking about the etiology of it, once we talk about the prognosis or outcomes in these patients, it will depend upon what is the underlying etiology of acute liver failure. And based on that, it is very important to identify the etiology. Uh, over the years, since 1998 to 2015, we have not seen the change in acetaminophen. And again, this is what we call a problem of Western world, which is an iatrogenic problem, meaning that in the US, most of these cases were either suicide attempt that there were kids or young adults who want to kill themselves and using acetaminophen. And there are also what we call, uh, you know, misadventures, therapeutic misadventures, meaning that uh, you know, uh, you may heard that in the Western world, opioid epidemic is big, that the patients are uh, using, or a lot of patients are using opioids uh, for pain control. And on top of it, there are a lot of opioid prescription, which has acetaminophen in it. And in addition to that, they are taking extra acetaminophen. So combination of it that increases the level also, if someone is using a lot of alcohol, the 
metabolism of acetaminophen also, uh, uh, you know, same pathways with the alcohol. And if people who are using a heavy alcohol use a binge drinking and also using a lot of acetaminophen can have more liver failure, even with the lower doses of acetaminophen. Uh, in the US also, you can buy as much acetaminophen as you can. You can go to any of the pharmacy and you can take thousands of pills without any restriction. And we are working with our uh, FDA, which is our drug uh, regulatory authority to limit the, how much people can buy acetaminophen. And that's what they did in United Kingdom or UK, where they limit how much they can. So if someone wants to use a lot of it or you know, wants to commit suicide, there is a limit, how can they use? Uh, but the point of this slide is that since 1998, in our network, depending on which year, we have not seen the decline in the cases of acetaminophen despite better education. So again, this is the main problem uh, as a cause of acute liver failure that we see in the US. Uh, we did talk about acetaminophen as a main cause, but why did acetaminophen causes acute liver failure or liver injury? And most of you have gone through, but I just wanted to very simplify that when you take acetaminophen again, APAP, normally the body mechanism is to use either gluconal transferase or sulfur transferase and make into two metabolites, which are non-toxic and ex ex excreted very easily. Uh, but then when these two enzymes overwhelm, or when you take an extra amount of acetaminophen, the remaining acetaminophen uses the cytochrome P450 system in the liver and change into NAPQ1. Uh, and this is the metabolite, which is being rapidly metabolized by glutathione transferase, GSH, and to get this non-toxic metabolite called mercaptopuric acid. So when you have this compound and you take extra amount of acetaminophen, this compound gets saturated or this enzyme gets saturated and rest of them uh, become into this protein adduct called NAPQ1 protein adduct, which is not only hepatotoxic or liver toxic, also can cause kidney injury. So a lot of patients with acute liver failure from acetaminophen can also cause ATN or acute tubular necrosis or kidney injury. So what happened is that this is also the enzyme that alcohol, if you're drinking a lot of alcohol, uses it. So most of the time it's recommended that, you know, uh, most of the cases that we see of acetaminophen overdose, they're using about 10 to 20 grams of acetaminophen in a day. And this effect of acetaminophen or Tylenol that being used in the U.S. and a different part of different names for it that, you know, uh, it's dose dependent. So you can predict what dose you have. And so most of the liver injury that we see, it's about if someone using more than 10 to 20 grams a day, uh, and still it's considered very safe. So a lot of, you know, patients with liver disease, if they're using 2000 milligram or two grams per day or four grams a day, they would be okay. So this effect of acetaminophen is dose dependent unlike idiosyncratic drug reaction with other medication like, you know, isoniacid, which we use for TB or antibiotic, like, you know, we use Augmentin or Doxycycline and other antibiotic that their effect is more idiosyncratic, meaning that it's not dependent on the dose. These, uh, these patients can have a reaction to these medications and can develop acute liver failure. So this is a simple algorithm and um, you know, we do use mucomest or N-acetylcysteine as one of the treatment for acetaminophen. And there are different theories behind that using it, but then there's a thought that this can replete this G, uh, glutathione transferase enzyme, but there are different pathways that the acetylcysteine can work. Uh, when you have in the US, we do think about as different toxicity level based on the phases of how much acetaminophen you have taken and how much time has been elapsed. So most of the time within the first 24 hours of toxicity from acetaminophen, patients have nausea, vomiting, or they would be perfectly fine without any symptoms. Then in the second phase, which has happened from 24 to 72 hours, 
patients can have right upper cordon pain. And then you can see the elevation of what we call liver injury where the AST, ALT is very high. And then you start seeing coagulopathy with prolongation of INR. And phase three that you can start having like, you know, which is uh, 72 to 96 hours, you have necrosis of the liver, patients can develop hepatic encephalopathy, worsening coagulopathy, and kidney injury with acute tubular necrosis. And the last phase is what we call phase four, which can happen like four days up to two weeks. And this is two ways that happen. If liver damage is not uh, irreversible, you can have either complete resolution of liver or you can have worsening liver disease, either patients die or need a liver transplantation if you don't uh, uh, you know, give them a liver transplant. So this is most. Most of the time, in, at least in our clinical practice or our big transplant center, the patients comes in if they are unclear, they are in the phase three. So they are already very sick, right? If you see someone like comes in early on, you can use charcoal and other things, but if it's already late, these patients may progress further uh, for uh, liver failure requiring liver transplantation. Uh, it is also very hard in, the, uh, in our uh, experience to make the diagnosis because a lot of these patients are very really confused because of hepatic encephalopathy uh, and they cannot give you the history and families are most of the time are unaware and patients, even if they are awake, meaning that they have not developed hepatic encephalopathy, a lot of these patients may deny the fact that they are using as high doses of acetaminophen, or they are just ignorant in a way that they didn't know that they are using acetaminophen in their opioid prescription and taking some extra acetaminophen also. Uh, there are several criteria our network has used that, you know, which suspect or which we call high likely or definite for a kid, uh, uh, for acetamine of overdose or toxicity. And most of the time is that you have like, you know, history of either ingestion or when we check a level of acetaminophen that's very high. And most of the time patient with acetaminophen overdose have ALT, AST greater than 1000. But the bilirubin is always almost less than 10 unless they have some different etiologies going on. So this is not anything classic. We are working on some new assays that we can actually look at the ADOX, meaning that most of the time acetaminophen just goes away from the body very quickly, but there's some metabolites we can, uh, you know, we check called the ADOX uh, in the urine or in the blood, but these are only in the research and we are developing uh, there are studies ongoing that we may have been available in the future. Now, uh, I did mention briefly, but uh, the treatment of paracetamol or acetaminophen poisoning is with N-acetylcysteine, and this has been going on for many, many years, that this was a paper in Lancet in 1977 talking about how to treat it with acetaminophen, and then there are many other studies for this. So N-acetylcysteine, uh, which is uh, mucomus in the US, is the accepted standard care of care antidote worldwide. And we should use it even if you have been in doubt about uh, the acetaminophen. I will show you some data that there are uh, patients who does have non-acetaminophen acute liver failure. And there was some evidence that the, this uh, N-acetylcysteine may be helpful even in patients who does not have uh, acute liver failure secondary to acetaminophen. But in any patient with acetaminophen, either suspected or confirmed, you need to start a mucomus or N-acetylcysteine right away that can save that patient's life. Now, some take home messages from acetaminophen that suspect this in, very, in any patient with very high AST, ALT and low bilirubin, uh, again, uh, uh, give n acetylcysteine if indicated or if in doubt. Uh, most of these patients in the U.S. have underlying site dysfunction or they have substance abuse. Uh, renal injury or acute, uh, you know, tubular necrosis uh, is very common in APAP, up to 70%. And then in, at least in the U.S., depending on whether you have transplant availability, these patients with acute liver failure should be managed 
majority of time in a liver transplant center because if they are not getting better, these patients will need a liver transplantation. So how do you, if you have a patient, right, and what are some of the part of the history overall if you are suspected? So if someone comes to your hospital or you see that patient who had no prior history of liver disease, now have coagulopathy and concern for hepatic encephalopathy, which is, uh, uh, you know, confusion, uh, what questions, right? So we try to search for an etiology, always ask as patient has taken any new medication, in the US or in the Western world, we do talk about acetaminophen. Has the patient any history of substance abuse? Uh, because you know that can put patient at risk for different virus like hepatitis B and other conditions. Has the patient experienced depression or made suicidal attempt? Or has the patient complained of GI effects after eating mushroom? One of the point is that although rare, uh, the mushroom or uh, uh, acute liver failure is talked by amanita toxin which is also a toxin to the GI tract. And most of the patient with uh, mushroom, uh, acute liver failure present with nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. So these are some of the um, uh, questions that we ask. And then for some of the medical history that would be important for us to understand, obviously if patient is pregnant, acute fatty liver or pregnancy and health syndrome is one of the consideration. Uh, in the U.S., we looked at if patient has traveled in hepatitis B or hepatitis E endemic areas. We had cases from Bangladesh or India or Pakistan that they're moving in and they, uh, you know, did traveling and then came in with acute liver failure. And so that hepatitis E uh, is itself is not endemic in the U.S., so we hardly see those cases unless they are it's immunocompromised patient or someone from. Uh, has the patient has received immunosuppressive therapy or chemotherapy? This is important in for hepatitis B patient that patient may have exposure or prior exposure to hepatitis B. No one knew about it and now given immunosuppression or chemotherapy came in as a flare of acute hepatitis B and acute liver failure. <clears throat> and then uh, we also look at autoimmune hepatitis and most of these patients can have either history of autoimmune diseases or they can have family history of autoimmune condition. And again, this is not uh, you know, uh, specific about most of the, but these are the minimum uh, uh, questions that we look into it or clinical history that we can identify towards the source of etiology. Now, when we look at the clinical feature of acute liver failure, as I mentioned, <clears throat> these are the sickest patient that we have in the ICU. Uh, you know, in these patients, once they get sick, they can develop acute lung injury with ARDS or acute respiratory distress syndrome. In the liver, we see a lot of changes that can happen because these patients' liver were perfectly normal until the acute liver failure happened. So one thing we see is that decreased gluconeogenesis. So these patients are very hypoglycemic, and that's why you, we used uh, very high dextrose strips to make sure that they're hypoglycemia gets better. They have difficulty in clearing lactate, so they have lactate acidosis. Uh, again, they have difficulty in ammonia clearance, so they have very high ammonia level. And they have synthetic capacity, therefore they have coagulopathy. So a lot of, obviously it's acute liver failure, so a lot of things are going on in the liver. Uh, sometimes they have bone marrow uh, suppression, especially if they have viral hepatitis or autoimmune liver disease. Uh, in the brain, uh, beside hepatic encephalopathy, one of the biggest concern we have is development of intracranial hypertension as manifested by cerebral edema. And that is uh, a common cause of death in these patients. And when we manage these patients, we focus on very uh, importantly to make sure that they don't develop uh, cerebral edema or intracranial hypertension. About 30 to 40 percent of patients uh, with acute liver failure can have pancreatitis for unclear etiology, but that is what we have seen. They can have adrenal insufficiency, and if they, especially with acetaminophen overdose or paracetamol or Tylenol overdose, about 70 percent of patients can have acute kidney injury or uh, kidney failure also. Uh, for admission, when we admit this patient, there are <clears throat> a different analysis or blood tests that we do at admission. Uh, 
Uh, and then we divide into three different categories. And this is based on the easel guidelines. One is the assessing the severity of liver disease and how we know how bad the liver disease with this acute liver failure is coagulopathy. So every patient should get uh, this full coagulation screen. Obviously liver enzyme, renal function, and two other important thing in these patients are arterial blood gas, lactate level, and arterial ammonia. But these are more for prognostic reason. And I'll talk more about it. If someone has profound acidosis or very high ammonia, these patients have poor prognosis. For etiology, and again, depending on what labs you have or whether we know what the etiology is, uh, you have to play by your area. But here we do toxicology screen and any patient coming in, as well as acetaminophen serum uh, level, we do viral screen, uh, virus, uh, obviously, if uh, hepatitis B, uh, hepatitis A, hepatitis E, and depending on the cause, we can use herpes, which is her, uh, HSV, uh, VZV, uh, same with CMV, EBV, parvovirus, so depending on where, which part of it. I also check herpes PCR, depending on, uh, you know, especially in a young woman and uh, with a history. Uh, check for autoimmune hepatitis uh, in a young person. If you don't know the etiology, Wilson's disease can present. Uh, and the Wilson's disease is a problem with copper metabolism and uh, cerebroplasmin and copper urinary can help. And every patient should get an ultrasound Dopplers to make sure that the blood vessels, like there is no evidence of uh, uh, obstruction of the hepatic veins and how the liver looks like. Therefore, it's important if there is availability to get a liver ultrasound with Doppler. Some of the complication is the pancreatitis as we talked about and um, in every patient we do recommend at least on admission to check amylase or lipase. Uh, infections are a common cause of deaths in these patients so we check blood cultures. Uh, there is a debate whether we need to start antibiotics in these patients right away or wait but uh, getting at least the blood culture is the key. Now let's focus on the outcomes in acute liver failure. So if a patient did develop acute liver failure, how these patients do? Again, this data is from the United States. And as we talked about from the United States, the most common etiology is acetaminophen. But if we take all the patients coming in, uh, we divide or the terminology we use are spontaneous survivor, meaning that they just recover just by medical management and about 48% or half of the patient will recover without any uh, need for uh, any further transplant. About 28% uh, or you can say one third of the patients will require, uh, you know, will kind of die. And one third of the patient, 24% will require a liver transplantation. So if you take in patients who spontaneously survive and patients who got a transplant, the overall survival in the US is about close to 70%, meaning that despite everything available without good ICU care with transplant, uh, there are about one third of the patient will gonna die uh, despite everything that has been available in the US. Now uh, we will now further go into different etiologies and talk about based on etiology, how these patients will gonna do. The first thing is that the prognosis and how these patients will gonna do is based on the etiology. What is the cause of their acute liver failure as we did talk, uh, start talking about it. And transplant-free survival mean that these patients will survive or they recover without a need for liver transplant. So I like to, in our network, we like to divide into favorable etiologies versus unfavorable etiologies. So if you look at the favorable etiologies, there are uh, the conditions that we consider favorable, meaning these patients, if they have acetaminophen, hepatitis A, uh, ischemia or shock liver, or acute fatty liver of pregnancy, or which is pregnancy related, a lot of these patients will kind of survive uh, without need for liver transplantation if they come in early and they're not very sick. So this is like 80 to 90. However, if someone develop acute liver failure secondary to hepatitis B, autoimmune hepatitis, 
other drug-induced liver injury besides acetaminophen, or if you don't know the cause of it, which is indeterminate. And I showed you the data earlier that a lot of part of the world, even in the US or in the other part of the world, there are a lot of cases are indeterminate. So if you don't know the cause of it, these patients will have a poor prognosis up to, depending on the etiology, 40% versus 30%. So prognosis depends number one on the etiology. So therefore it's important to know what the cause of acute liver failure is. Now, after the etiology, uh, the second most important prognostic factor is whether this patient has hepatic encephalopathy and what is their grade of hepatic encephalopathy. So if you do have any etiology, but if you have higher grade of coma grade, then these patients will even have worse prognosis. When we talk about the grades of hepatic encephalopathy in acute liver failure or any uh, chronic liver failure, we divide it into four different grades. One is the grade one, which is changes in behavior or sleep reversal cycle. The second grade, and, and these are because of toxins build up, especially ammonia, that the second grade is they become disoriented, they have lethargy, they are very slow to answer question, and they have these asterixes, which most of you heard about. And when you ask the patient to do it, there is a, you know, the hands are shaking like that, and that is what we call asterixes. But then if they further have worsening their coma grade encephalopathy, they will have marked confusion or obtentation. And ultimately they will develop comatose, they're completely unresponsive and loss of reflexes. So we normally divide into two different, uh, whether they have early hepatic encephalopathy, which is grade one to two or coma grade and the severe form, which is grade three to four. And when we divide into different etiologies plus the coma grade, we can get uh, an, uh, you know, more prognostic indication. So I showed you, uh, you know, now this is the graph uh, that shows you that you have the etiology as well as coma grade. So I showed you earlier that, you know, patients who have uh, acetaminophen, they do well and hepatitis A. However, what this is showing is that what is their coma grade and what do the patients do? The coma grade one to two, which is an earlier grade. So if you have acetaminophen and you have early coma grade, these patients will gonna do. However, if the patient comes late to us and they already develop severe hepatic encephalopathy or coma grade, then these patients, despite having a good etiology or prognosis, they would only 50% will gonna uh, live without the need, uh, without, you know, will gonna die or need a liver transplant. Same with hepatitis A. Although these patients, a lot of them do do well, but if they already had severe hepatic encephalopathy, they may not do well with ischemia and acute fatty liver. So coma grade becomes very, very important. And what we think that coma grade one, to, uh, if they have early coma grade one to two, these patients have 50% better survival than someone with grade three to four. Uh, they are different. So we do talk about etiology and coma grade. The one of the common thing that you hear and when you go or Google or read about is King's College criteria, which is established in UK King's College. And that is based on like, you know, about 30, 40 years back, they developed this criteria likely, which patients will need a liver transplantation and still very valid, but there are other uh, criteria have been used in different part of the world and different, uh, and they have some utility. Uh, you know, we do talk about King's College criteria. Again, it has been used that which patient will need a liver transplant and they divide it into acetaminophen versus non-acetaminophen category. So acetaminophen, if you have significant uh, acidosis, so if you on an arterial uh, pH is less than 7.3, or all of the following, if your INR is greater than 6.5, you have acute kidney injury of creatinine 3.4 or severe hepatic encephalopathy, this patient, this patient will need a liver transplantation. Non-acetaminophen, any patient with a coagulopathy with INR of greater than 6.5 or three of the following, they don't have hepatitis A or B, or they have some other cause or idiosyncratic or indeterminate. If they develop jaundice to hepatic encephalopathy greater than seven days, they are young or very or greater than 40 years, they have INR greater than 3.5 or very high bilirubin. 
if they have three of the following criteria, they will need a liver transplantation. So you can get an idea based on this to see which patient will need a liver transplantation. <clears throat> so principle of care is that we have, first of all, you do need to have very high index of suspicion at the time. Uh, there are many patients, in, even in the US, they get admitted and then no one checks their INR, they're confused and they think about some other etiologies, but no one paid attention that it can be acute liver failure. So you need to have very high index of suspicion. Uh, most of these patients, if they have acute liver failure in the US, they need to manage in the ICU setting because they can uh, rapidly progress and it can go into multi-organ failure. And if they are getting into that multi-organ failure and get the only effective treatment then become emergent liver transplant. Therefore, in the United States, most of these patients get transferred to a liver transplant center if possible. We do incubate for coma grade two to three. So because uh, management is becomes very easy and there is no substitute for experience. If you manage these patients on a regular basis, you will have a better idea about and so critical care management in these patients is very, very important. Now, I did mention that, you know, uh, although uh, we use acetaminophen, uh, you know, and acetylcysteine, which is mucomus for uh, acetaminophen overdose, but there was a study which was done almost more than a decade back using these patients who did not have acetaminophen, which is non-acetaminophen acute liver failure, and try to understand whether these patients will kind of have any benefit. So bottom line is that even if you don't have uh, acetaminophen as the cause of it, uh, if you start these acetaminophen in non-acetaminophen cases, meaning that they have hepatitis A or hepatitis B or any other cause of it, if you start them before they get really sick, meaning that if they have not developed hepatic encephalopathy, right, these patients will gonna do well. So my, uh, you know, one of the recommendation or my uh, suggestion would be that if you have a patient with acute liver failure, if you have availability of an acetylcysteine, we do recommend starting it early, even in patients who are non-acetaminophen acute liver failure. So I'll just uh, briefly talk about some specific therapy and some management before ending the talk. Uh, we, I know for specific therapies, if these patients, uh, we could talk about uh, N-acetylcysteine, if they do come in in the phase one and phase two or early, uh, we can, in, in our emergency room, we do use charcoal. For autoimmune hepatitis, uh, if you have a patient early on, the corticosteroids, if you make the diagnosis, that can be used. Hepatitis B, any patient you suspected of hepatitis B, you start an antiviral treatment. In the US, we have entecavir or tenofovir or the substitute. Uh, but if they already had developed severe liver injury, meaning they have grade three to four hepatic encephalopathy, they may not recover, but this is one. If you suspect someone for herpes infection, we do start acyclovir until the labs are back. Uh, you know, in mushroom toxicity or mushroom, uh, there are penicillin G and there is a compound called silibinin we can use. The important thing to note, if there is a pregnant woman who has acute liver injury or acute liver failure, the cure is delivery. And at most of these patients will get better once you deliver the baby. And Wilson's disease is rare, but uh, you know, you can, we can use different things, but ultimately these patients with Wilson's disease, if they develop acute liver failure, you need a liver transplantation. Uh, it all depends upon the specific therapies based on how sick these patients are or when they showed up to your hospital. In supportive care, so some of the things that we do recommend is that N-acetylcysteine for everywhere. And then I'll talk about a few things. One is intracranial hypertension. So intracranial hypertension, as I mentioned, is one of a very severe complication in these patients. It happens mostly um, in patients who have high coma grade. It can happen up to two thirds of the patient or 75% if your coma grade is four. And this is a cause of death in about 25 to 35% of cases in acute liver failure. And this is a condition that is correlated with higher your arterial ammonia level because your brain is not used to this much ammonia an astrocyte gets swollen, and then, you know, it can develop cerebral edema and herniation. And high arterial ammonia in these patients, if they are very high, it can be a risk factor for intracranial hypertension. 
And therefore, at least in the US, in most of our centers, especially UCSF, we manage most of these patients with acute liver failure as they already had intracranial hypertension and managing it. Uh, just to give you an idea, this was a patient that we have seen a few years back, a 32-year-old male. We didn't know what the exact etiology. They were very sick and we had an offer for liver transplant, but you can see that when the offer comes in, uh, this patient had no uh, gray to white differentiation, has a significant cerebral edema. And unfortunately, this patient, despite having an offer liver, liver transplant, herniated and unfortunately passed away. And so this is uh, a very concerning and very important complication that we keep an eye on it and manage it aggressively. And how do we manage it? That there are simple prevention tools that uh, we need to manage the fluid management. In the US, we do start a continuous renal replacement therapy, which we call a continuous dialysis to make sure that the man fluid is managed. Uh, but if you don't have it, at least having minimum uh, stimulation head of the bed at 30 degrees. Sometimes we use permissive hypothermia. And if they, someone had developed intracranial hypertension, we do use mannitol or hypertonic saline. Uh, sedation is important to make sure we don't stimulate them as much as possible. And in uh, very severe cases, we can use like barbiturate coma, but this is uh, depending on your expertise, critical care need, your neurology. So there are different factors, but this is an important management tool. Uh, we don't like, you know, most of these patients can, INR can be very elevated, but uh, as you know, patient with liver disease does not, I elevated INR can be different, uh, but we don't transfuse like, you know, FFP, which is fresh frozen plasma just for INR alone. We just monitor these patients. Lastly, management of infections, because it's a very common cause of death in these patients. Uh, it can be seen up to 80% of patients and 40% death. Uh, we do recommend surveillance. And although prophylactic antibiotic have shown no benefit uh, but if they do develop blood, uh, bloodstream infections, they have increased uh, mortality rate. In our centers, at least, that we do use, uh, you know, some antibiotic, but other centers uh, do not use it, so it varies. But uh, what we have seen that if these patients can be at a very high risk of infection, so we do uh, blood cultures and use some antibiotics uh, uh, for this, but not uh, proven by data. Uh, kidney dysfunction can be a major indicator of pro, uh, poor prognosis, and most of the risk factor for renal dysfunction if they're older age, acetaminophen, uh, acute liver failure if they have uh, uh, sepsis or SIRS, uh, or they have underlying infection, and that if a patient with acute liver failure also develops uh, renal failure, these patients will not do that well, and they likely need a liver transplant. I'll pass on, but uh, uh, in summary, Acetaminophen is the most common cause of acute liver failure in the U.S. However, in other part of the world, viral hepatitis, hepatitis B and hepatitis E are one of the common causes. Uh, it's important to know what the etiology of liver disease, acute liver failure, as etiology and coma crate are the most important indicators of prognosis. Uh, the that some of the causes of death that we do worry about is intracranial hypertension, cerebral edema, and infections. Supportive care, including N-acetylcysteinomucomis. Uh, in the US, at least, we start early renal replacement therapy and prevention and management of intracranial hypertension are critical to the survival of these patients. Uh, it does require uh, specialty care, so these patients are in the ICU. Uh, we, in the U.S., at least a liver transplant is the centerpiece because these patients, if they're not getting better, we do offer liver transplantation and they can get a liver transplant within 24 to 48 hours if they become a candidate. So in the U.S., we do manage these patients in our transplant centers. Treatment and prognostic, there are many different trials are ongoing in the U.S. However, it is important to use and acetylcysteine uh, in every patient. Uh, we do need more better accurate uh, prognostic ways, but always remember the hallmark of acute liver failure. Uh, development of coma uh, and within a patient with no prior history of liver disease 
and a high INR, and that is an important and you cannot miss the diagnosis of acute liver failure. Uh, this is the end of my talk, and I would love to answer any question. Uh, uh, so there's a one question I saw in the question and answer session that can you repeat the anecdotes and how many times uh, for severe? So, you know, again, that is an important question. They're two different, right? Uh, in the U.S., uh, uh, as I mentioned, the, one of the most common cause of acute liver failure is acetaminophen acute liver failure. In acetaminophen acute liver failure, we continue the n cysteine and mostly we use it in the drip form. Uh, because most of our patients cannot tolerate in the oral, but that's perfectly fine that you can use the oral also if patient can tolerate. But in acetaminophen acute liver failure, we continue, there is, we don't stop it. We continue it until the patients get better or ALT and AST becomes less than 1000 and the INR start improving. So there is no end, we continue that. However, um, the second one is that the, if you don't have uh, you know, and non-acetaminophen causes of it, then we just continue with their dosages of it, whether there's any, uh, and finish their like recommended uh, doses, which is about 21 in the US. Uh, but whether you can continue it, I don't, uh, you know, there's no data, there's no harm in continuing unless patient is in heart failure. Uh, so you can repeat the, if you don't have liver transplantation available, you don't have anything, you can try to uh, continue, but the data is not there. Uh, <clears throat> and then the question is that if there's a delay in giving NAC, after how many hours can, uh, after ingestion can be uh, going after presentation? Uh, you know, you start the NAC, it doesn't matter when the patient comes in. So, you know, you cannot, you know, most of these patients in the US comes late. So I would not delay. Most of the time, these patients have been delayed or not been. And, uh, you know, I hardly see patients who comes in and get a charcoal in the U.S. because these patients come late. Uh, we start the NS adult system. Doesn't matter when the last, uh, you know, ingestion is, and we just go forward with it because even if it's the later stages, this have some potential route as long as patients have not developed hepatic encephalopathy. My rule is that if a patient comes to the emergency room and then they are have not developed hepatic encephalopathy in acetaminophen then they're unlikely to get sicker because it, the management is so uh, good. Uh, it's hardly I've seen patients unless they have a different etiology. Most of the patients that I have seen who are very sick with acetaminophen, they already are comatose and they came in like, you know, five, six, seven days later, right? So if they come in early on, they would be like, it's just diabetic ketoacidosis. And they come to the emergency room and then you can manage it uh, with the insulin and with the proper management, they should do well. So I think that is the key that if they have not developed. So, you know, I would start an acetylcysteine, doesn't matter what time is it and continue with it, okay. Excellent, thank you so much for your lecture, Dr. Hamid. That was, that was very thorough and um... We really appreciate it from Health for the World. And, you know, um, I'm going to move forward and actually uh, request for one of the groups to go online with our audio and video and ask you questions, if that's okay. Okay, okay this is the internal medicine residence at the Mabingo Baptist Hospital in rural Cameroon. So I'm going to ask them to unmute right now. Let's see if we can go through. I'll ask them to start video. Hey there, everyone. Hi. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Hamid, for the presentation. Very excellent presentation. This is uh, Mbingo speaking. Can you hear us? Yeah, we can hear you. I can hear you. OK, thank you very much for the presentation. I think this is really very uh, relevant. Um, we've seen a number of patients with acute liver failure from hepatitis B. I think we've had a number of patients uh, uh, with acute liver failure related to acetaminophen toxicity. Um, the problem in our setting is that we cannot make a, a diagnosis objectively of hepatitis A. So again, that makes things difficult because I remember from your, one of your slides you projected and said that hepatitis A related acute liver failure has a good prognosis.
So mm -hmm. sometimes when we see that and we cannot make a diagnosis of that, we, uh, we tend to classify those patients as indeterminate. Mm -hmm. um, so that is one of the challenges we, we have out here. We cannot objectively make a diagnosis of hepatitis A. Um, thank you very much for the presentation. I'm gonna leave, uh, I don't know. So uh, one, can I ask you a question? Sorry, uh, yeah. what are the, the acetaminophen cases that you see? Is it, uh, you know, is the, is the suicide attempts or do you think? Sure. Okay. Yeah, yeah, suicide attempt. And then right. is it like same in the United States that you can go to the pharmacy and you can buy like thousand tablets if you want to? Yes, exactly. You can get it over the counter anywhere. Along oh, the road okay. side, you can get acetaminophen anywhere. And then you have like oral form of uh, mucomist available or N-acetylcysteine. Do you have an oral form available? Yes, we do. Okay. Very okay. available. And then I suppose that uh, in uh, your, uh, you don't have liver transplant possibility with these patients to get sick, right? Absolutely not. We do not yeah, have the liver transplantation. Okay. Okay. Yeah which makes things really very difficult for us. Yeah, no, I think it is, uh, it gets really difficult, not in your country, it's like a lot of other parts of the country also. Okay. All right, I'll give the floor to the residents. I'm sure they would have some questions for you. Thank you. Oh, hello. Hi, how are you? Hi. Fine. My question is about um, hepatitis B. Um, normally we told that hepatitis B can be a self-limiting infection. And so with active hepatitis B, you, you don't give um, treatment for hepatitis B. But looking at this presentation, uh, it shows that for hepatitis B with active fever failure, you're giving, um, that you should give nucleotides. So, so I don't get it. Like, I think um, I, I, I would like to understand more because I thought with um, acid hepatitis B, it can be self-limiting. So you can give the body the time to see if it will clear. And then those who have chronic hepatitis B, those that inherited, um, um, depending on the E antigen and the hepatitis B viral DNA, but it's the chronic hepatitis B that is usually put on treatment. But somebody is coming with an active fever failure, and the treatment is that you should put the person on nucleotide. So, I just so you know, again, uh, there, you always have to differentiate. And you're talking about hepatitis B, right? Yeah. Okay. So hepatitis B can present with different forms of it and depending on what stage of it, right? And, you know, we will, uh, the good thing is that next month, uh, one of my colleagues will talk about the hepatitis B and there's a tone different. You know, it's important to differentiate the chronic management or the chronic hepatitis B versus the acute. And there are two different forms of uh, acute hepatitis B, right? One is that someone has a flare up of they had prior exposure and now they get exposed to chemotherapy and immunosuppressive agent and then now they have a hepatic necrosis. And the second is acute hepatitis B, which can happen with the drug use and in an adult form, right? So they are two different, whether you have a flare up or not. And what happened with acute liver failure that they have hepatitis B and they have flare up, they develop a lot of hepatic necrosis and a lot of other uh, uh, things that happen. And then once they develop acute hepatitis B with the liver failure, then their viral load is significantly elevated. And we try to start these medications, but once they already develop uh, hepatic uh, coma or coagulopathy, they may not recover. In fact, that you know, in our experience, one sees patient with acute hepatitis B flare up, and most of the cases that we see in the United States are because of the flare up. That they are from other part of the world, they're getting chemotherapy, the immunosuppression, and they didn't need the therapy beforehand, but then their body was controlling it when they are immunosuppressed. That hepatitis B now had flare up and develop significant necrosis of the liver. And that's the reason the liver keep getting sicker. And even then, if you're, you start the antiviral therapy, which is in Tecovir and, you know, or Tenofi, whichever we have available, that, that even if the viral load is coming down, sometimes the liver injury is already significant that you cannot have it recovered and these patients will need a liver transplantation. Uh, sorry, I have to give another talk in about two minutes and a half to log on. Uh, 
So I can take one last question and I can just, uh, sorry about that. Doug, thank you very much for the presentation. You are yeah, welcome. My, yes, my point is uh, concerning the comment that was made about the patient, patients who come in, the possibility of a patient coming in uh, earlier, say maybe before the first 90, 96 hours, because we have seen that uh, most of these patients will develop uh, signs of liver failure like 48 to 96 hours after ingestion. So I had read about the Rumac, Rumac, uh, Rumac Matteo nomogram. Yep. It's a graph that is used to assess yep. the risk of patients who can develop uh, acute <laughs> liver failure, acute liver failure following um, acetaminophen toxicity. So I, I just thought to that up, maybe you could have some comments regarding that. And for us here, who cannot measure uh, plasma acetaminophen levels. Yeah, I think, I, to be honest, that, you know, most of the time our toxicologists uh, try to use that, but, you know, in, an, in a liver setting, in acute, like, you know, I, most of these patients that, you know, uh, a lot of times they don't develop the liver injury, right? That they, they, they have these, they come in early and then they've been managed in the ER with the charcoal. I personally don't like the rumex because there are a lot of different factors involved in it. And in our studies that has not shown, we look back at all of our acute liver failure patients with acetaminophen and they came very late to us and that the RUMAC is early if you bring it on, you know, if you started on early, you start in these patients well, but what we see our patients are at the later stages in our liver transplant centers, right? They already passes that phase. And then when you go back and look at, see whether someone checked there and then everything, that was not very helpful for us. So I, you know, you can use it uh, if early on, but we see patients at a much later stages and that is helpful in that regard. We are coming up with, there are different like new nomograms that are being building up right now. And then, and that maybe I think would be more helpful. We are just doing uh, some research on it to see whether that would be better than that, okay? Okay, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Habib. Thank this you. will conclude our International Hope for the World Bye. programs today. Thank you.